So today we actually have uh, Hasib Qureshi on our uh, new episode of Building the Open Web. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. Good to chat with you, Sasha. Cool. Maybe we can start with a brief background on yourself. Like, what what you mean focus these days? So I'm a managing partner at Dragonfly Capital, which is a cryptocurrency venture capital firm. Uh, we have an office in Beijing, an office in San Francisco, and we invest in crypto and blockchain startups all over the world. Um, so most of my day, you know, I basically wear the investor hat, but the investor hat in crypto entails a lot of different things. So I spend a lot of time uh, talking to teams, uh, learning about different uh, protocols, uh, uh, writing research, and you know, chatting with some of the other interesting folks in the space, like like yourself and um, technologists working on new projects. So as an investor, I sort of get the best seat in the house. I get to see everything that's happening in the crypto industry from a, from a fairly broad view. Um, if there's one downside to being an investor, it's that you, know, you, you don't get to be nearly as deep as somebody like yourself, who's you know, sort of going deep into one particular project or one particular ecosystem or niche. Um, but I get to pay for that, uh, or sorry, I get, I get the compensation of getting to go broad and seeing the wider perspective. And overall, um, where did you grow up? Maybe we can start also from beginning to. So I grew up in Texas, actually. I was born in uh, College Station, and I grew up as a kid around different parts of Texas. I actually went to high school in a small town called Dripping Springs that had about, the time that we moved there, it had maybe 2,000 people in the entire town. So my upbringing you know, was, uh, I think, relatively... Like people, people meet me and they think that I grew up in some kind of metropolitan environment, uh, especially because I, you know, I don't have an accent coming from Texas. Um, but I grew up, you know, my dad was a was an engineer, and so I always grew up with an affinity for technology. And I was one of these kids who really grew up on the internet. You know, I, I remember like AOL and um, the dial-up era very fondly as being a big part of my. Uh, youth and adolescence and coming into learning about the world and learning about things outside of uh, outside of Texas um, and uh, getting getting some uh, real sense as a young person, which I think a lot of people of my generation got of the internet kind of being your pathway to a global citizenship um, where you couldn't necessarily get that in person, uh, but you got that sense from being a part and interacting in online communities. Uh, and so I got that from a from a very young age. I think that informed a lot of my uh, a lot of my affinity and excitement about the ability for online coordination of large groups of people from different parts of the world uh, to to work together on common projects, which is precisely what what crypto is. And uh, what was your initial passion? I noticed that you you've been involved a bit with poker on a quite a competitive level. <laughs> yeah. So how do you get yeah. into this? So I first got into poker. So when I was when I was very young, I didn't really know what I wanted to do per se. I had this vague idea that I wanted to get into physics, um, and so I, I initially was studying math and physics. And I realized at some point that I wasn't very passionate about it. And I was always somebody, you know, I, as as a young guy, I played a lot of video games. And at one point, I got invited by some friends to play a poker game with them. And I didn't know anything at all about poker. I'd never gambled. I'd never really, you know, I played like some card games with my cousins, but uh, I wasn't really a, a card player. But um, some friends invited me to play poker with them. I had no idea what I was doing. You know, basically lost all of my play money. I, mean, I wasn't playing for actual dollars back then. Um, and I was, I was 15 years old at the time. And uh, I, I got so embarrassed from having just, you know, kind of not knowing anything at all about poker, that I remember I, I sort of went and when I got home, I, I looked up the rules of how to play poker and also looked up some very simple strategy of how to win at poker. And what I learned, you know, I read this article talking about this generation of young poker players who are very successful, most of whom are playing out of their college dorms. They were applying math and statistics and game theory to a game that primarily had been driven by you know, these kind of old school card rooms that were, you know, largely built on people who played basically on instinct and hadn't applied a lot of really rigorous tools to examining how poker worked at a mathematical level. And, you know, reading about these young guys who were making all this money, I was like, hey, you know, I bet I could do that. You know, I'm pretty smart. I have a lot of free time. Uh, I, I wonder, I wonder how, how well I would do. And so I remember, you know, I was, um, I was, I, I just turned 16 
And I was, you know, I started playing like some play money games online, uh, trying to teach myself the rules of the game. And uh, I was like, hey, you know, I think I can, I think I can do this. I think maybe I can make some money playing this. And so I called up my older brother, who at the time he was 18 and he was in, he was in school, uh, in university. I called him and I said, hey, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've started playing some poker. Like, I think I'm kind of figuring out the rules and the strategy. I think I might be pretty good at it. Uh, could you give me 50 bucks? And I'll start playing money, and you know, I'll split, split some of the money with you. And he was like, "What? You're playing poker? What are you doing? You're supposed to be in school. Like, you know, don't don't ever call me about this again. Like, just, you know, stop doing this." And I was like, "All right, screw you, whatever." Uh, and so eventually, I found uh, this. There was this website called Party Poker at the time, which is one of the largest poker sites back in uh, 2006 when I when I started playing. And Party Poker was running this promotion where if you scanned your driver's license. And you'd never played on Party Poker before, they would give you 50 bucks to start playing and sort of, you know, kind of get you into the, the habit of playing poker. And so I was like, okay, you know, I don't have a driver's license, but I could, uh, you know, this was in the early days of Google Image Search. And so basically I just like looked up various search terms related to driver's license. And eventually I found a driver's license belonging some, to some little old lady in Maryland. Uh, and I turned that in and that was the $50 that I started with. That was like how I started my career as a poker player. And because I didn't have anything for myself, I didn't have any money. Um, uh, and obviously nobody knew that I was playing poker in my family. I only had these $50. There was no other way for me to get money. And so I very carefully worked my way up with these 50 bucks, starting playing the, you know, the, the five cent, 10 cent games, the 10 cent, 25 cent games, slowly working my way up until, uh, by summer, I, I think I started in like February, 2006. Uh, by that summer, I turned that $50 into $2,000. And then by the end of that year, I turned that $2,000 into $100,000. And that was really the start of my poker career. And, you know, I was still in school. I was still underage. I didn't really know what I was doing. So poker really took me on um, a journey that I think actually is analogous to what a lot of people in the crypto industry have gone through. You know, I, I sort of look at that generation of poker players who came up at the time that I came up, seeing poker as this this game, this way to make a lot of money by using your mind in a space that a lot of people didn't really understand and that was sort of underutilized and doing a lot of almost what I would call basic science and really discovering things, discovering mechanics about the game that nobody else really understood or had analyzed at that time. Um, where there are no books, there's no you know guides, there's no there's no real way to learn this stuff other than by you going in at the frontier and discovering what is the right way to play poker and what are the optimal strategies to 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 defeat other players. Um, it was so much fun. It was so intellectually captivating, and I see a lot of glimmers in that. Uh, I see a lot of glimmers of that in what all of these you know these really young guys who are young guys and girls who are getting into crypto who are you know playing around in like DeFi yield farming and then of course before that you know maybe in 2017 getting into crypto trading and uh you know the, there, there's always going to be some hustle for young smart people who are willing to take slightly subversive paths in life to do things that other people might look down on or think is kind of weird or, or inappropriate um, but to apply their minds to uncover new ideas and new strategies and to make a lot of money doing it. At the time, it was poker. And I think today, poker has become so optimized that it's very difficult for you know, a, a new person to come into the poker industry and make good money. Uh, but you know, there's always some next thing. So you know, it was poker, maybe eventually it was fantasy sports. Now I think it's mostly in crypto. Um, and inevitably, you know, it's crypto for now, but two or three years from now, it might be something else. Yep, that's a really helpful analogy. Um, maybe we can jump a little bit further, like many years probably ahead. How did you get into crypto? What was the initial interaction for you? So I quit poker when I was uh, when I was twenty. Uh, just about to turn twenty one is when I quit poker, and you know I did I did a lot of stupid things when I was a poker player, and eventually I decided that I wanted to get back into. Uh, I, I really wanted to pursue technology, and so. I ended up uh, eventually, I, my degree actually is completely non-technical. So I studied philosophy and English, which is as far as you can get from from technical degree. Uh, but I decided that I wanted to get into the technology industry. I moved up to Silicon Valley. I learned how to code. Uh, and I ended up uh, getting a job at Airbnb as a software engineer. And that uh, was really where I caught the crypto bug. So you know, at Airbnb, I was working on payments fraud. And I was actually on the same team that Brian Armstrong was on when he 
left to go found Coinbase and actually worked on some of his code, which was not very good. Uh, and the, you know, I think the, the, the revelation for me when it came to getting into crypto was really around, you know, working at Airbnb. Airbnb is, you know, obviously a global company because it's a travel company and you have to pay people and receive payments in, you know, 80 plus countries. And running uh, a payment system, especially a payments fraud system that has to sort of somehow abstract over all these different payment systems in all these different parts of the world, you realize how incredibly leaky of an abstraction it is to pretend that there is a global payment system. There's not, right? There's like all these different disparate, most, you know, in, in various states of disrepair, local payment systems that one has to abstract over, but you can't pretend they're all the same. And so there are many systems where, you know, there were CSVs that got emailed every midnight and they were manually reconciled, or there were places where there was literally no digital payment system. And so we had an automatic system set up to like mail checks to PO boxes, you know, and to receive checks. And like, that was the way that we sort of pretended that these payments were being automated. And so seeing all that cruft, like this big, you know, pile of spaghetti, uh, as an engineer, your first instinct is, oh, we should throw all this out and we should start over. We should rewrite it from scratch. And I realized that that was what crypto was. Crypto was all these you know, it was, it was these economists and computer scientists and cryptographers and game theorists who got together and said, knowing what we know today, how would you redesign a financial system from scratch? You know, being, being 21st century citizens where we understand cryptography, we understand decentralization and, and, and peer-to-peer systems and all, you know, algorithmic monetary policy. Uh, and all these different cryptocurrencies were sort of different experiments in building out new versions of, of a financial system. That's what got me really excited. And it got me convinced that crypto was absolutely going to change the world. And, you know, I'm not one of these people who thinks that, or who ever thought that, uh, yeah, you know, 30 years from now, we're all going to be paying each other in Bitcoin. I don't think that's, that's likely to happen. Uh, but I do think that almost certainly the way that we do money in the future is not going to be the way that we did money 50 years ago. And crypto is going to have a large role to, to play in determining what the future of money looks like. And so, you know, after I left Airbnb, uh, I started really trying to dive deep into what was going on at the time in the in the crypto ecosystem. You know, this was in the heyday of ICOs and uh, the Ethereum ecosystem was really coming to its own. And so I remember, um, you know, I, I ended up partnering up with uh, my buddy, Yvonne, who, who you know well, he uh, used to be at Google Research. And he and I, uh, first thing that we did, just try to learn as much as we can about what was going on in Ethereum. And he and I developed a... Uh, an exploit, a vulnerability against Bancor, which at the time was one of the largest um, ICO projects. It was really the, the first DeFi project on Ethereum, I think, of, of significant scale. Um, we discovered a front-running vulnerability against it, disclosed that. That's kind of how we first made our name. Then I worked very briefly at 21, which became Earn.com, sort of consulted. I got to know Bology pretty well. Um, and later, um, after I left there, I was working on a startup alongside Yvonne. We were working on a stablecoin startup. And it's very funny, actually, because we... At that time, uh, this was sort of the first generation of DeFi projects on Ethereum. And we actually, the first thing that we did is we came up with a, I mean, the, 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 our, our first thing actually was that, you know, we saw a lot of really crappy tokens at that time. I think a lot of people did. And at the time, there was no way to short any of these tokens. You know, there weren't really robust derivatives markets back then. And lots of these markets were pretty liquid and very mature. And so we were like, man, I really want to short some of these crappy tokens because they're really terrible and clearly overvalued, but there was no way to do it. And so we, we started coming up with mechanics of having this way that you could short sell uh, some of these tokens. And it turned out that basically what we had designed, we, you know, we had like a white paper that we were working on, what we had designed, the mechanics of it, were basically a decentralized derivatives protocol. And about a week after we like basically shored up the fundamental design for this protocol, DYDX released their white paper. And we met Antonio and we were like, hey, we've got like a very similar thing. We sort of traded ideas. And there was so much overlap that we were like, okay, you know, Antonio is an impressive guy. This is a big market. Let's go work on something else. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's many other things. Probably he's got this market cornered, which is a crazy, crazy assumption I've made back in 2017. So in retrospect, I can say like, wow, there was totally room for multiple people to be working on it. But at the time, you know, it sort of seemed like it was so greenfield that it's like, why would you, you know, tackle the same market as some other smart guy. And so then we were like, okay, well, you know, really a US dollar peg is kind of a derivative, right? You can sort of use a derivative to instantiate a dollar. And so we had this idea to like basically mold the mechanics of our derivatives platform to create synthetic 
uh, crypto backed dollars. So like, you know, create sort of a, a, a crypto dollar. And then a week after that, MakerDAO announced that they were going to finally launch Psy. And so then we were like, shit, we keep getting front run by all these different projects. And like, and, and we, again, I think someone naively thought that like, okay, well, you know, Psy is launching their thing. Clearly MakerDAO has been working on this for years. They've got all this community. There's no way that we could win this market. And so we abandoned it again, I think very stupidly, uh, because in retrospect, these things were so nascent at that time. There was so little going on for them that the fight was really ahead of us, but we just didn't, we didn't know that at the time. And so we ended up pivoting toward building actually a, a centralized stablecoin. So I think what was a, a better version of what ended up becoming USDC and PAX and all these different uh, stablecoins, which I think are pretty vanilla, kind of the most obvious thing you can think of. And we, we shopped it around to some exchanges and we, we had some acquisition offers. Um, and then I ended up meeting Naval through an introduction from Bology and Naval pitched me to become an investor and to sort of join the dark side. And instead of working directly on one particular project and one particular company, uh, to instead, like I mentioned, sort of get the um, get the balcony seat and get to see everything going on in the space and be able to make principled bets on what I think the future is going to be within crypto. And uh, he made us a very attractive offer to join Metastable and Yvonne and I ended up joining and that's how we started our investing careers. So that's in a nutshell how I ended up becoming an investor in crypto. And uh, I think it's it's been a pretty insane experience because we you know, we, we've gone through now, you know, some ups and downs within the crypto investing cycle. Um, it's put some hair on our chest and given us some experience of what investing in crypto really means. Uh, but I've learned so much and it's leveled me up so much, not just as a as an investor, obviously, but just as a human being that uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't give it up for anything. So there are times that I think like you know, what would have happened if we'd gone down the entrepreneur path. But at this point, I'm I'm very happy to be on the investing side. And I learn so many amazing things. I get to I get to see everything going on in the space. I get to talk to all these amazing entrepreneurs and I get to help them in bringing their visions to fruition. Uh, and so there's there's not a whole lot that's as satisfying as getting to do that. Got it. And how, how did you get to Dragonfly and how do you approach your job today, learning what you learned at Metastable about crypto investing? How do you approach it? Yeah, so I got to Dragonfly, basically, you know, I'd, I'd gotten to know Bo, who's the other managing partner at Dragonfly, uh, while I was at Metastable, because actually Dragonfly was an investor in Metastable before I came on board. And they, you know, I got to know them pretty well, and I was, I was, was sort of somewhat intrigued by what they were doing. Um, but I, I didn't really get the Asia angle, which is a large part of, of Dragonfly's ethos. And it wasn't until I sort of sat down enough times with Bo and really kind of got his perspective uh, you know, so when I was at when I was at Metastable, Metastable, you know, we had a lot of uh, you know, big Sand Hill Road VCs as our investors, and kind of, you know, we, we were we were sort of a, a very standard Silicon Valley VC firm, uh, sort of the constitution of of Metastable, and I realized that one of the big weaknesses of that Silicon Valley centric approach to crypto, you know, there was this assumption back then that well, basically every great project is going to, you know, they might not be have, have been created in San Francisco, but they'll come to San Francisco. They'll come pitch us, they'll sit down at the Silicon Valley coffee shops, and they're going to meet all the investors and do the roadshow. So whether, you know, whether we're in, you know, Berlin or Tel Aviv or whatever, it doesn't matter. They're going to come here and they're going to, we're going to get all the best deal flow in the world. But that wasn't true of Asia, right? Basically, pretty much every deal that we saw from Asia when I was at Metastable went straight from our desk into the trash can. And that's because there was just no ability to underwrite the deals that came from Asia, they're just so different. The way that they communicate is different. The market dynamics are different. And uh, this is just kind of a universal problem, I think, for a lot of the Silicon Valley oriented VCs to really understand Asia. Almost nobody has done it well. Uh, almost always what they've found, you know, you look at like Sequoia, China, right, as being a perfect example, you, you have to get specialists who really understand the local geography if you want to invest in, in Asia, because it's just such a different landscape than investing in the West or investing in, in Anglophone markets. So realizing that and then realizing, you know, something that Bo told me that very much resonated was that, you know, crypto is not like the Internet. It's tempting to think of it like the Internet. And I think, you know, especially in Silicon Valley, we tend to abuse a lot of these metaphors about how, oh, it's like the Internet, 1995, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, in reality, crypto is fundamentally different. And one of the ways in which it is fundamentally different is that crypto is global in a way that the Internet never really was. 
right? And so there's this there's this kind of whitewashing of the internet. Was like, oh well, you know, obviously packets can go anywhere in the world and blah blah blah. But the reality is that the internet, you know, uh, it it the internet is is tremendously splintered, and we know that. You know, there there are different social networks that are dominant in different countries. There's obviously the Great Firewall in China. There's uh, you know different regulations and legislation in different countries that prevent companies from kind of being uniform across different geographies. But not just that. But the reality is that you know internet companies that are built very often you know you start a company that's an internet company you start in San Francisco but you don't have a global go to market until basically you're a quite mature company right so really up until even you're a billion dollar company you're not going to even bother thinking about an international uh, expansion plan and crypto is different the whole point of crypto is that it's global is that it's borderless is that there is no financial gate between East and West. And if anything, we know that the majority of capital in crypto flows through Asia, not through the US, not through the West. Uh, the majority of trading volume, even the majority of uh, of unicorns, of billion dollar companies are, you know, if you look at the exchanges, you look at the mining companies, you look at the hardware companies, most of them are in Asia. And so all that is to say, if you're just looking at one part of the elephant, you know, I think in a lot of ways, people who are too Silicon Valley centric, and I think I, I was very much guilty of this, you're sort of grabbing onto the trunk of the elephant. You're like, oh, okay, here's here's what the elephant is. But if you don't sort of zoom out and see the whole thing, you have to understand what crypto is doing in the markets that it's actually serving. And you know, I personally believe at the end of the day, crypto is is has much less to offer to somebody who's living in the first world, who basically already has great financial services, who uses Venmo and PayPal and all these services uh, fairly fluidly. Um, and of course, who has access to any financial product they want in the world and to you know the reserve currency of the world, which is the US dollar. It's people who are outside of that inner ring who are going to benefit the most from the interconnectivity of crypto. Uh, and so if you don't see that, if you don't understand those markets, I think it's very difficult to invest in crypto well. So that was kind of what, what got me to join Dragonfly. And then you had a second part to that question, which I, I think I just forgot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, another question, how do you spend day to day now as an investor in Dragonfly? Well, I, <laughs> the answer, Obviously, it depends day to day. You know, there's a lot of a lot of my time is spent talking to entrepreneurs. That's kind of the bread and butter of being a VC. You know, on top of just the the natural overhead of running a company or just you know managing your own team, dealing with your own investors, um, there are uh, there's always interesting things happening in the space, especially as of late with this, this DeFi mania that's been going on. And so I spend a lot of my time meeting with entrepreneurs, meeting with our portfolio companies, meeting with other you know sort of smart, thoughtful people in the space who I who I want to learn from. As an investor, you know, my principal job is really to understand what the future looks like and to make bets and orient my portfolio in such a way that it reflects what I think is the most likely path the future is going to evolve in. And so a lot of my time really is kind of doing the same thing that everybody else is doing in this industry, which is just reading and talking to people and writing and thinking about, you know, where is this stuff going? What, what is it going to become? What, what is, where is Bitcoin going to be in five years? Where is Ethereum going to be in five years? Uh, where, where's DeFi going to be in five years? That um, just sort of deep thinking is really, I think, also a large part of my of my job and how I try to orient my day, although I'm not always successful sometimes on meetings from <laughs> dawn till dusk, which is also tough. And maybe we can also touch some section here on on your writings too, because you you write quite a bit. You're like a pretty prolific writer in in space. How did you get into writing to begin with, and what's the motivation behind writing for you? So I've always been a writer of sorts. Um, you know, I, I think it's a it's a habit that I learned a very long time ago, back from when I was a poker player. And I think there it, it's there there are a couple of reasons why I I write. One is that I like teaching people and I like helping people. And to the extent that, you know, I'm always learning new things. And very often, you know, I think people, when they think about writing, they often think like, wow, what do I really have to say? What do I really have to help somebody with? But everybody's learning things all the time. And my instinct is that whenever I learn something, and I think that thing that I'm learning is, is, is fairly um, difficult to learn or insightful in some way that, you know, it's, it's like you, you could read all these different articles about X, Y, Z, but it's very hard to get it until you get this insight. And if you get that insight, then the whole thing makes sense. Um, that's very, very common in crypto is that there's something that 500 people explain with all this different jargon and they're sort of repeating each other and it's all kind of this big mesh. But then if you just kind of really boil it down and try to understand the principle behind it and explain that, then suddenly a thousand times more people will get it. Um, and so the, the ability to 
encapsulate your own learning and your own understanding is not only very helpful to other people. And the thing is, you know, oftentimes what I write about is not the cutting edge. You know, it's sort of like one layer behind the cutting edge. You know, it's, it's sort of like this is the stuff that's happening that's like kind of at the vanguard. And a lot of people, the smartest people in crypto, you know, people like you, you already get it. You already understand. It. You don't need to explain it to you. But there's another layer of people behind you who they don't understand all the terms. They don't understand all the jargon. They don't understand all the metaphors. And so refiguring these things in a way that helped me understand it helps that other thousand times more people understand it as well. Um, and I found that one, it helps me, it, it helps people to learn this stuff. Uh, but second, it also helps me. And that's the thing about writing that I think few people really appreciate is that it helps me so tremendously clarify my own understanding and my own thinking. So if there's something that I'm trying to learn that I find I sort of have a very fuzzy understanding or a very, um, I, I'm not really truly getting what this thing is and how it works. Or I'm really trying to figure it out. Then committing myself to like, okay, I'm going to write something that explains this, this category. That is the most powerful forcing function to really force me to clarify my thinking and my understanding and my mental frameworks. Because the one thing, you know, it's very easy to fool yourself when you're talking to yourself or you're talking to your friends or you're in conversation. Once you start writing, it's suddenly very, very clear what you understand and what you don't. So that's the other reason why I try to write. And do you want to maybe mention some of the recent writings you did? Maybe give a brief, brief summary or just like maybe you can direct people to your writings. You can see a lot of my writings on um, our, our research page. So we have a, a research arm called Dragonfly Research. If you go to dcp.capital uh, or just search Dragonfly Research, you can you can find it. Um, so I write fairly frequently for our, for our research publication. Some of the writings I've done recently, um, they include writing about uh, AMMs and where they came from, why they're so successful. I write quite a bit about Uniswap. Um, and what I think the future of AMM is going to be. Uh, I wrote a piece earlier this year on flash loans and uh, what I call flash attacks, which are flash loan denominated uh, hacks. I wrote quite a bit on you know security of DeFi and, uh, and and proof of stake and how they interact. So every time that I see a really exciting, interesting idea that I don't fully understand, I write about it and I, I share that writing with uh, with the wider community. And and sometimes it's helpful, sometimes uh, sometimes less so. Uh, so you never know with writing, but uh, I just try to follow my instincts and write things that I think help me. Uh, if I had read my own writing a month ago, what would I wish I'd written? And that's that's my North Star. And I believe you've been also working on a comprehensive educational piece at like nakamoto.com, right? Correct. So that's a much longer term project, but I've been writing um, sort of a kind of introduction to cryptocurrencies for people who basically are very early in the space, don't really, you know, maybe haven't been paying as close attention for the last few years, aren't working at it full time, uh, but who are technical and who are curious to understand the, the undergirdings of how the system works. This it was a much longer term project. And unfortunately, it's taken a bit of a back burner as I've taken over more responsibility at Dragonfly. Uh, but I want to finish this sometime over the next year or so. Basically, it's kind of comes from the same principles that you know when I was learning crypto and really getting into it, the educational resources in the space are so hit or miss. And there's, there's no real like one single path you can go through to learn all of the fundamental concepts that are necessary to understand crypto. And so I just thought like, man, I really wish that there had been a course like that, that I could have worked through that gives me all the building blocks to understand everything else in crypto. So that's what I wanted to, to, to do with this course. Uh, unfortunately, I've gotten so sidetracked that it's sort of sitting there about, about I think three eighths of it are completed. But if you want to check it out, you can, you can find it on nakamoto.com. Mm -hmm. And overall, like since you joined the space and uh, up until now, do you think the state of education in space improved or do you think it's just as challenging it's improved quite a lot. It's improved quite a lot. But that said, I, I still don't think there's any really, truly great resources out there. Um, so I think like, you know, if you look at machine learning, right, machine learning five, six years ago was fairly tough to to break into, you know, like, I, I think at this point, there's now, you know, Andrew Ng's course, there's like fast.ai, there's like these really great central beacons of learning about machine learning that I think everybody in the industry is like, look, go here, this is the best place to start. It'll basically teach you all the building blocks, right? There, there really isn't anything like that for crypto. There's so many little breadcrumbs everywhere. And it's like, oh, read these like 30 blog posts, read, you know, watch this video from, you know, Antonio Antonopoulos or Andreas Antonopoulos. Like, you know, look at this thing, look at that thing. Uh, but there's no single canon uh, that's like, you know, the, the place where if you go, you're going to get all the important concepts. So I think that's still missing. And I, I expect that hole will get filled. I don't know if it'll be by my course. It might be by something else. But I, I'd really love to see that because I think that's such an important part of crypto that's very neglected. 
uh, is, is just the, the, the really great onboarding for new technologists who want to enter the space. Yeah, but something we, we think a lot about just like or like how do you, how do we increase the uh, rate of people entering the space, like new builders joining the space uh, every year? Do you think education is a key to this or there are like some other ways you can attract people into the space more effectively? I think education is obviously one part of it. It's a very important part of it. Um, developer tooling is another really important part. Is that I, you know, I know so many engineers who basically were kind of interested in playing around with crypto, started five minutes of messing around with Remix or you know MetaMask, and were just like, okay, screw this, I'll come back when it's ready. And you know, you sort of it takes some work to convince people that it's ready. Um, you know, the the other the other alternative to that is you know if you look at uh, mobile engineering in the early days, you know the mobile tool chains were really really painful. Uh, back when mobile was first starting to take off. But because there were so many users and there were so many opportunities to make money as a developer, people just bore, you know, they just grit their, grit their teeth and they stuck with it. Um, crypto had a moment of that in 2017, and it's getting a little bit of resurgence of that with DeFi, but I think there's still um, not really enough ways for people to, you know, be able to build and monetize tools. Um, you know, if you have the greatest, latest, greatest idea for a DeFi yield farming, such and such and such, you know, maybe there's a way to make money off of that, but it's, it's still a little bit niche and it's not something that somebody outside of crypto would be able to pick up and say like, great, I'm going to build like this great tool to do X, Y, Z. And, uh, it's, it's still a bit unapproachable, uh, the ways that you can make money and really capture value within crypto. Yep. And do you, do you think we're definitely not yet at the place where like re, re, a lot of repeat entrepreneurs come in here, strong product teams? Do you, do you think crypto is like wildly seen as one of the like the places to go to, or do you think we're like completely not there? I think if you're a great product team, uh, crypto is a very weird choice. And you know, I think the point at which it will not be a weird choice is one where we see growth not just in the price numbers but in the user numbers. And like most of, I mean, here's the thing about crypto, which is also, I think, easy to misapprehend, is that crypto is, is in many ways much more akin to finance than it is to the internet. And what I mean by that is that, you know, there are, there are certain companies that have been tremendously successful, uh, many financial companies have been tremendously successful, that the, the normal, you know, everyday Joe Schmo will never have heard of in their entire life, right? I think you and I know this for quite well, but uh, you know a lot of people in this industry, they think of the internet as basically being the only model for building uh, technology products, and which is really not true, right? Like there, there are many multi-billion-dollar uh, technology companies that don't deal at all with end consumers and don't have hundreds of thousands of customers. It depends on the size of your contracts, right? If you have very, very large contracts with enterprises, or you're dealing, you know, financial management, you have a relatively small number of LPs who are um, endowments or uh, sovereign wealth funds then actually it doesn't take that many uh, individual people on your platform for you to be a very, very valuable thing. And so the same thing is true of crypto. Crypto can be tremendously valuable without scaling to millions or tens of millions of people uh, by just having really, really high value uh, sort of transactions or high value quote unquote contracts be on chain. Uh, but that, uh, that makes it difficult to have this very, very broad and wide ecosystem with many, many developers coming on board and building this like big lush rainforest of, of different projects. That is difficult when you don't have a lot of users and a lot of heterogeneity in people's desires and, and, and wants. Um, so I think if, if crypto crosses that chasm and really goes mainstream, then I think it's likely we'll see this big renaissance of many, many more entrepreneurs. But I think it's also important to understand that because crypto has this financial aspect, it doesn't actually need that in order to be valuable. Now, it might not be what we want to create. We might want to have a system where, okay, value aside, coin prices aside, market caps aside, we want to see tens or hundreds of millions of users get onto crypto infrastructure. Um, but those are two totally orthogonal axes that you know require different strategies to optimize for. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And overall, uh, if you imagine yourself like joining the space for the first time today in uh, late 2020, how would you approach the space? Like, what would you do in the space if you're like new builder coming to the space or new entrepreneur? Like, what would you do? Probably the first thing I would do is I would, I would try to get involved with a project that already exists. I mean, this was this was sort of my instinct when I first got into this industry. Was I mean, that's what I went to 21 for, was uh, which came out com was to basically just get my chops to get a better vantage point in the industry and understand the norms, the problems, like what are the pain points, what really sucks, what's great, 
try to do it from your from the vantage point of just a, a kind of somebody who just has ever traded crypto or played around with MetaMask, you're not really going to get as deep of an understanding of what the landscape looks like if you don't actually work on something first. So I would say before you try to build something or create something, work on something. It doesn't necessarily have to be joining a company. You could work on something open source. You could team up with some friends and do something pro bono. You could do something on like Gitcoin. You know, I don't know. Do something. Right? But get get your get your chops actually building in this industry. And then you'll get a sense for where the real problems are and where your skill set will be most valuable. Yeah, that's super helpful for our listeners. Well, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you for joining today. The last question I have is where do people find more information about you? Is it GCP Research the main source or is it also your personal website? Yeah, uh, you can come find me at, uh, find me on Twitter. I'm at Hasib on Twitter. Um, you know, you can you can obviously see our research and a lot of what we do at dcp.capital. And uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you're working on something interesting, feel free to reach out and uh, we'd be happy to happy to chat. Cool. Thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me, Sasha. Thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of this podcast at openwebcollective.com. If you're a founder looking for help with product, go to market or fundraise, apply on the same exact website. It's openwebcollective.com. If you really like this episode, I would really appreciate if you give us a review on a platform of choice where you listen to podcasts to. And finally, if you're on Twitter, we are at OpenWebFounders. Again, the handle is at OpenWebFounders. I'll see you next week.